Hi, my name is Bess Flysovlovich, and today I'm going to talk about the theory of hybrid quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics methods, QMMM. So we've talked in the course so far about both molecular mechanics, so force field development, and when a force field is good to use. We've also talked about different levels of quantum mechanics that we can, can apply to chemical systems. Uh, Hartree-Fock and post hartree fock We've also talked about density functional theory, semi-empirical methods. And so today we're going to talk about cases where you might want to use a combination of these approaches uh, for some system that you're interested in. So why might you want to do this? Why wouldn't you want to always choose one level of theory over the other? Um, I think a really nice example of this is when you have a very large system and I think uh, one that's very easy for us to visualize is a protein. So say you have this large protein and you just can't afford, even with um, the more inexpensive uh, types of QM methods, uh, to study the whole thing at that level of theory. But you have some event, perhaps it's an active site in an enzyme, that you have bond making and breaking, and you want to study that event. So you really need to have the QM level um, in order to properly describe bond making and breaking. However, if you remove the environment, the reactivity you observe um, can change drastically. So QMMM, in a sense, is, is a compromise between um, wanting to study large systems and wanting to treat uh, the question of interest uh, at the appropriate, appropriate higher level of theory. And so how would this look like and, and what would we do? So we're going to start with um, the most straightforward way to dissolve, to uh, divide the space. And that would be if we think about having a solute and solvent. We'll come back to the idea of an active site and a protein later and discuss how we might partition uh, the regions, the QM and MM regions respectively um, at that point. But if we, if we think about about a space that in this cartoon would look like this, where we put in this purple MM region the solvent molecules, and in the in the blue QM region the solute, the interaction between the two spaces um, is non-bonded, right? So so this squiggly line that that represents our, our QM space doesn't cross any any bonds, any covalent bonds, just non-bonded interaction. And so we can imagine computing the energy expression, the total energy of our entire system as being the sum of the QM energy, the MM energy, and then the interaction between the space, so the energy between the molecules in the QM region versus those in the MM region. So how would these energy expressions look like? Well, um, basically the, the energy in the QM and MM regions look just like what we've seen in this course so far. So you would compute the QM region using the types of expressions we've seen up to this point. Perhaps you use um, you use uh, density functional theory in the QM region and then in your MM region you would compute the energy within the MM space using typical force field terms. So perhaps you decided to use the amber force field and then you would compute the interaction between the different solvent molecules using, using uh, the force field parameterized, uh, al the already parameterized force field. The difference with QMMM is that now we have to understand what the energy is for the molecules that are in the QM region um, interacting with the MM region. And how are we going to describe this uh, since they've been treated at, at different levels of theory? And so that's what we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of the video. And I'm starting by showing you this expression here, since these terms are common to all of the um, all of the expressions we'll see later. You have a one one electron interaction term, and um, and then electrostatics between the QM and MM regions. Now, in the expression I've shown here, we only have point charges. Of course, we must add non-bonded terms to actually actually run the simulation. Just like in um, the force field, we couldn't only describe the interactions between molecules using electrostatics. We also have to have uh, non-bonded terms as well. 
but uh, you can see that that really this is is kind of a a combination between our we can see analogies already to uh, force field type interactions uh, except we have the positions of the atoms coming from two different spaces so how do we define these spaces and then what implications does that choice have on how we compute uh, the energy EQM MM here so the first uh, one we're going to talk about is if we just have a boundary through space so the one that I described when I discussed this cartoon where we have um, a solute in the QM region and then the solvent in the MM region so the boundary is simply that we've drawn a partition around around some some molecule or set of molecules to say that they're QM but other molecules um, are, are MM so only non-bonded interactions connect the two spaces um, and then later in a following video we'll also talk about uh, boundaries through bonds so when we when we actually do draw draw this uh, squiggly line in our cartoon when we draw that around some sort of region that is bonded to the MM space how will that change how we express EQM MM so the simplest way um, that we can describe the interaction between the two spaces is if we consider only unpolarized interactions and what I mean by that is that we computed the energy for the MM space and then we computed the energy for the QM space and we we make the assumption that they're mutually exclusive we say that the energy uh, that the MM space doesn't affect how we compute the QM energy and vice versa that means in our in our term where we have the interaction between the two spaces that is the way that we're, we're linking the only way we're linking the spaces and so the expression shown here you can see that we have um, electrostatic interaction and then we also have a non-bonded term and this non-bonded term is a Leonard Jones expression uh, of course you could use other expressions however this is uh, the most common and um, when we use the Leonard Jones expression what what we have we, we need to know these these Sigma and Epsilon terms for atom type and so whatever force field you use to describe the MM part the Leonard Jones force field for that part already has has these atom types assigned and and you know the parameters what uh, what we can do is we can assume that within the MM space say you have a carbon atom atom in the MM space we can assume that that carbon atom has the same Sigma Sigma sorry and epsilon values as the corresponding MM uh, carbon atom would have the analogous one and then use that to compute the interactions and that's what is what's done um, likewise in in this portion you can see that the the I sum over I refers to the solute so remember that's the QM space and so above that we see this this notation CM1 and this is here uh, because on the next slide we'll we'll talk about a specific uh, example where charge model one is the way that we compute the charges for the solute so in a in a quantum mechanical calculation we have a density but we need to in order to compute the interaction with the MM space we need to have localized charges and so some sort of charge localization scheme needs to be used to assign atomic charges and so in this equation CM1 is simply noting which which charge uh, which charges were used QJ of course is for the solvent and since we're using a force field each atom type in the force field already has an atomic charge associated with it and so we use we use that charge now alpha is commonly used as a parameter to refer to polarization and I already told you that this is an unpolarized interaction but in a sense this is uh, it's polarization in in the sense that we have a QM solute that could have charge so if you had a solute that's neutral or a solute that's positively charged the solvent should see a different type um, should be affected by that in the sense that um, 
the electrostatic interaction between the solute and solvent should should have some sort of difference if you have a, a charged um, solute or not, right? And so it's treating solvent polarization by adding this additional parameter. So um, it's not really fully polarized like we'll see um, in the other QMMM approaches. We haven't we haven't induced anything on how we computed the energy of the QM and the energy of the MM space separately. Okay. So um, one example of using this type of an interaction in a QMMM calculation was uh, done by Kaminsky and Jorgensen, and they refer to this. Uh, method as AOC, so A referring to AM1, O, OPLS, C to the charge model. So they're using AM1 to treat the QM region, uh, the OPLS force field to treat the MM region, and then they're obtaining the charges for the QM region using charge model 1. And so um, in, their, in their case, they uh, they're able to study study these systems, and they see that um, overall that they can treat polar salvation effects very well. For example, um, in the book, you'll see a case where they treat rhodomeric equilibria, but um, they don't do quite as well for nonpolar solvents. So if we think about why that might be, it makes sense because in a polar solvent, the di there's a dipole, and so the interactions with the solute will be uh, dominated by the dipole interaction. However, in a nonpolar solvent, induced dipoles will become more important, and in our unpolarized interaction, we're not allowing the solute to induce a dipole upon the solvent. So I guess it makes sense to me at least why they might not do quite as well in that case. Um, however, they do well for treating solvation free energy effects along a reaction coordinate, so treating the reactants at the QM level and then allowing the solvent to be treated at the MM level, they can um, account for the salvation along the pathway. So if we want to move uh, one step further and we want to allow our two regions to interact even more, we could consider allowing the QM region to be polarized by the MM region, but keeping the MM region unpolarized. So what this means, um, for our equations at least, is that we're going to separate the interaction of the MM part with the solute electrons and the solute nuclei. And so if you, if you look in the, um, in the expression for the interaction energy, you can, you can see that our sums have, uh, of course, been split, and then we still have the non-bonded part. Uh, <clears throat> However, this is just for the interaction between the QM and MM spaces. Um, I briefly mentioned on the last slide that it, that one of the reasons why we consider one of that in order to be considered polarized, one the MM part would have to affect how we calculate the energy of the QM part. Um, of course, it will affect how we calculate the energy of their interactions as well. But the main change, uh, the one I want you to really think about, is how how we allow the MM part to affect the HQM, okay? So MM stays the same, it's unpolarized. QMMM, I showed you on the last slide, we separated uh, the, two, the two parts. And then we, um, if we think back to our original expression for the, the QM region, we're going to allow the MM part to affect uh, this, this portion, right, so to affect our, our nuclei. And we're going to split it again. So we're going to sum over the solvent nuclei and over the MM atoms um, and add that into, into our sum. And in this way, the MM region can induce a polarization upon our QM region. So finally, um, we could, it seems logical that we would go one step further. Um, Perhaps we think that allowing the solvent to be polarized as well will be very important, and there are certainly cases where it is. Of course, uh, the more interactions we include, the, the more expensive it becomes. We already know that polarizable force fields are more, um, more cost-intensive than non-polarizable force fields, and that's, of course, 
also true in this case. However, um, when we move to the fully polarized bull interaction, what we would do is when we compute the energy for the MM region, we take a polarizable force field. And um, in a polarizable force field, you have each atom type assigned a, a polarizability tensor, which we call alpha. And in this way, we can allow induced dipoles. So you can have uh, this induced dipole that depends on, on alpha for that atom type and then the field. So this way, you allow the QM space to induce dipoles upon, upon the MM space. And of course, uh, like we saw in the previous case, the, the MM space can, can induce polarization upon the QM space.